All right. Now for how they get around. Modes of transmission. Uh, and there's three main ways. Uh, and I'm going to give examples of each. And most diseases can actually get around by more than one way. So the first is contact. And contact can be either direct, indirect, or droplet. Direct contact is like touching, touching, biting, scratching, or sex. Um, uh, any sort of direct contact with somebody's blood, um, direct contact through, say, I don't know, kissing, um, through fighting, anything like that. Um, but that's, so that's direct contact. That one's pretty obvious. Uh, indirect contact is, uh, contact that occurs through what are called fomites. Fomites are objects that, uh, like if, let's say I sneeze into my hand and then I pick up a, uh, can of coke and then i hand that can of coke to you and you grab it with your hand and then you rub your eyes with your hand right in this case the can of coke served as a fomite for indirect transfer in general most pathogens don't survive very long on surfaces. This is especially true of viruses, uh, but can also be true of bacteria. Uh, they don't like to live, they don't like to hang out on non-living things because there's not really much for them to eat. So a bacteria isn't probably gonna survive for too terribly long on a can of Coke, uh, and a virus even less so because I mean, there's nothing there for them to eat. And for viruses, like once they dry out, they have a tendency to just pop, especially if they're enveloped viruses. Naked viruses can last a bit longer. Um, but yeah, so that's indirect transfer. Droplet transfer is considered a type of contact transfer. Uh, this is when you, uh, you like, you cough or sneeze and you release relatively large droplets of saliva into the air. Um, many of the diseases that we think of as being airborne are technically droplet transmission, not airborne. So to give some examples of this, okay, so direct contact is pretty obvious. A good example of something that's transmitted through direct contact might be uh, HIV, all right? You're only going to get it through sexual contact with somebody else or potentially through blood-to-blood -blood contact with somebody else. Uh, mono. I suppose mono might be transferred indirect through sharing a drink. Um but is usually transferred directly. Uh, indirect contact. So this is, for instance, COVID, why everyone is washing their hands all the time. The idea is that your hands are likely to get whatever you have on them. And if you touch things with your hands and your hands have COVID on them, then the COVID is going to get on that thing and somebody else could touch that thing and then they could, I don't know, touch some food that goes into their mouth, rub their eyes, something like that. Um, so to prevent the spread of COVID and many, many other diseases, we wash our hands a lot because we touch things mostly with our hands. Um, now, we actually think that, that COVID doesn't transfer very much through fomites. Um, it can transfer through fomites, definitely. Um, but there's been, 
relatively little evidence for it entering the body through the eyes. Um, and so you would have to have something that's going to transfer the, the virus from uh, something that you handled to your hands and then from your hands into your mouth, right? So I guess that's possible. You could touch something that then goes into your mouth. You could sit there and pick your teeth, uh, something like that. This is less common. Now, droplet transmission. We all know about social distancing now. Uh, it's probably something that's going to be in our lexicon for decades to come. And uh, the, this is where social distancing comes from. So these larger droplets that are mostly released by uh, sneezing or coughing or something like that, um, these are droplets that are like relatively large. They're usually more than a micron, sometimes up to a couple of millimeters. Uh, and these large droplets settle out of the air relatively quickly. Um, the transmission distance is listed here as being one meter or less. Uh, oops. One meter or less. Uh, for, for COVID very early on, uh, the standard is for two meters, actually. And... Um, the idea there was just to make sure, like most of them are going to fall out of the air and settle onto a surface within one meter, but some of them might take more than one meter. If you cough or sneeze, it can actually eject uh, droplets at a relatively high velocity um, and carry them further away from you, or, or if there's a breeze or wind. But the, these things don't stay in the air for very long. They don't build up. Uh, on the other hand, as large droplets, they can contain a lot of infectious particles. Infection is dosage dependent. Usually getting like one virus or one bacteria in your lungs or in your body is not enough to infect you. I mean, I guess it theoretically could be, but your, your immune system is going to probably track down one thing pretty fast. The odds of that one thing being able to hide, unless it has some special ability to hide, are pretty low. So it takes many infectious particles to be able to, to actually infect someone. But one large droplet can carry many infectious particles, many bacteria, or many viruses. Um, and so this is what the, the six-foot rule is for, is to prevent droplet transmission. Next is vehicle transmission. These are the borne transmission, airborne, waterborne, foodborne. And I'm going to talk about them... I'm going to talk about airborne last. So let's talk about waterborne first. This is pretty obvious. The pathogen, whether a virus or a bacteria or something else, lives in water. You generally drink the water. And, uh, and, and that's how it gets inside of you. I can think of one circumstance that's waterborne by air. It requires like the water to be forming mist and you have to breathe it in. Um, and that's Legionnaire's disease. But for the most part, that's pretty rare. So usually if it's waterborne, it's gonna get into you through you drinking the water. Food board. So the, the thing either bacteria or virus or whatever, lives on food, and it gets into you through you eating the food. Uh, often, these are going to be microbes that, like, are living on the food because that's where they're happy and they're eating the food, right? So bacteria that's growing on food. Uh, but it can also be uh, viruses or something that has gotten onto the food during preparation. 
like somebody wasn't washing their hands or wasn't, uh, you know, uh, properly cooking the food or um, wasn't wearing gloves when they handled the food and it got, um, got contaminated and then you ate it and it got inside of you. So most cases of food poisoning are this. Uh, some cases of food intoxication, like say botulism, uh, th those are foodborne. Uh, you know, we've all probably had some foodborne infection over the course of our lives, whether we know it specifically or not. Um, so both of those are pretty obvious. Now, airborne um, takes a little bit more thinking, right? Because we have droplet and airborne, and these are not entirely the same thing. Uh, even though they're both going to be diseases that you get through inhaling them. Uh, airborne, first off, applies to things which are dry. Things which are dry don't weigh very much, and they can be carried through the air great distances. Um, not necessarily forever, but for a long way. So this can consist of uh, dry spores, maybe from a fungus that lives in the soil, uh, or um, uh, from a bacteria that lives in the soil. Um, usually not going to be dry spores from a person, but that's possible. Uh, it can be skin flakes. Um, it's very common for uh, some particularly viruses, but also some bacteria to infest your skin and your dead skin dries and flakes off all the time. This is what actually makes up most of the dust that you find everywhere in the world. It's mostly dead skin cells. And that dust, as you're no doubt aware, can get into the air and can be carried everywhere around the house, everywhere around an environment. So those are, uh, uh, th those are dry things. There are also particles that travel more, or droplets that travel more than one meter. These are usually called aerosols. Um, these are very tiny droplets. They can stay in the air for a long period of time. Some of them can stay in the air indefinitely. They don't usually require like coughing or sneezing to get into the air, um, although they will get into the air when that happens, uh, but they can get into the air merely through talking, singing, laughing, chewing, anytime you have your mouth open, uh, but especially anytime you've got sound coming out of your mouth, uh, aerosols can be formed. Now, aerosols are very tiny, which means that they don't especially carry very many infectious particles. Um, so often you would have to breathe in quite a number of aerosols before you get infected. Um, and, um, but because they, uh, they don't settle out, they can build up over time. So for instance, uh, say you have, say, say you're in a restaurant and somebody on the other side of the restaurant 20 feet away, has COVID. Uh, they're largely asymptomatic. They're sitting there talking. They don't have their mask on, right? Um, as they talk, they're building up aerosols that contain some virus particles in the air around them. Um, these particles are most concentrated near them, but can spread outwards through diffusion over time. So uh, within five minutes, 
there's probably an infectious dose for maybe five or ten feet around them. Uh, after 10 or 20 minutes of them, you know, sitting there talking, stuff like that, uh, now the virus particles may have spread from them all the way to where you're sitting, 20 feet away. And, um, huh, uh, all the way to where you're sitting 20 feet away. And, uh, now you're probably not going to get sick right away from that because you have to bring it, breathe in a large number of these particles before you've actually probably gotten enough, uh, enough virus in you to get sick. But a lot of people think, uh, due to some things that were said very early on in the virus, that if you're six feet away from someone, you, like, can't catch COVID from them. And that is simply not true. That is something that we thought early in the process, uh, when we thought that COVID was only transmitted through droplet transmission and indirect fomite transmission. Um, but... Around midsummer, it was confirmed that COVID can be transferred through aerosol transmission. And what that means is that you can be on the other side of the room from someone and uh, you can still get from them. Especially if um, you are both not masked. So, uh, it does, however, take time, right? You're not going to get it from somebody across the room if you're in Walmart and you're both walking down an aisle together, right? It takes time for this cloud of aerosols to build around you. And that time is very activity dependent. If you're talking laughing, shouting, singing, right? Those are going to get more aerosols. If you're just sitting there with your mouth closed, you're probably not getting very much of any aerosols into the air. They mostly come from your mouth, not your nose. Um, and the louder you are talking, the more they're probably getting in the air. So if somebody's sitting on the other side of the room having a low volume conversation, which they're mostly eating, but also talking very, very quietly with somebody else, they're probably not building up much of an aerosol cloud around them. On the other hand, say you're at a concert or a uh, comedy show or something like that where you're going to be sitting there for large periods of time, you know, maybe an hour or two hours, and you're maybe like screaming your cheers or you're laughing really loud or something like that. Um, in that case, you're probably going to build up a lot more of a cloud of aerosols around you. Uh, and those are going to be much more dangerous situations for something that is airborne. Um, even if you're at a socially distanced concert where everyone is six feet away from everyone else, right? If you're there for long enough and if you're all like shouting and stuff or laughing, then those clouds are going to build up pretty quick, maybe within five or ten minutes. You could get a infectious dose from someone else especially if you are around the other person for that long, right? If you're only in brief contact with them, you're probably not gonna get it. And this is why uh, they define contact with COVID as spending five minutes in the vicinity of somebody who is infected. Um, and, uh, because with this aerosol transmission, like obviously if they sneeze in your face, you're probably going to get it right away. Um, but uh, if you're just sitting there talking with them, then it's mostly going to be transferred through these 
aerosols. And that does take a little bit of time to build up. Uh, and this is why we say, like, even if you, you say, oh, I'm socially distanced, I'm, 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 I'm more than six feet away from you, I don't care. I want you to still wear a mask. Because you being more than six feet away from me does not mean that you cannot infect me. It just means that it's going to take a little bit longer, and it depends on what you're doing and how many aerosols you're generating. And the wearing a mask is going to cause you to generate way fewer aerosols because most of them are going to get caught in the mask. So when we say a disease is airborne, that's what we mean. It's transferred by these dry spores or by these aerosols that remain in the air for long periods of time. Um, and this is why, particularly with COVID, but for any airborne um, respiratory infection, uh, why masks are so extremely important. They decrease the amount of aerosols that come from your mouth, and they also decrease the ability of aerosols to get into my mouth. So it protects on both sides. It is particularly important to wear your mask when you are indoors and when you are engaging in activities that open your mouth, like talking or singing or something like that. Uh, if you're outside, it's actually relatively difficult for aerosols to build up, especially if there's even a little bit of a breeze, right? You can still have droplet transmission, so you still need to maintain distance. Uh, if somebody coughs and you're within six feet, you could easily get it. Um, but if you're just talking with someone outside, like even a little bit of a breeze is going to disperse the cloud of aerosols around them, and that means that it's going to have a much harder time building up. This is why COVID is like about 20 times less infectious outdoors than it is indoors. And this is why uh, in the summertime, where did you see COVID spike? Texas, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, parts of California, particularly Southern California. Why? Well, what do you do in Nevada or Arizona in the summertime? Do you spend a lot of time outside? You like walking around in that 115 degree heat? No, of course not. Everyone stays indoors where it's nice and air conditioned, where COVID spreads easier. Why are we seeing a spike now? And where are we seeing a spike now? Ohio, Wisconsin, uh, places like that, places where it's cold. Because in the wintertime, what do you do in Wisconsin? Do you go around outside? No, you certainly don't talk outside a whole lot because it's freaking cold. So you stay indoors. So you're going to see COVID and really any aerosol transmitted disease have different periods of activity in different places. Like this idea of like cold and flu season being in the winter time. Um, I mean, some of that is true for geographic reasons, but a lot of it is just because that's where the major populations live is in colder climates. Um, you know, in Europe, things are a, a fair amount colder than they are here. There's not a whole lot of deserts in Europe. Um, so people stay indoors in the wintertime. In like New York, the upper Midwest, things like that, uh, you see a lot more transfer of respiratory droplet transfer uh, and um, aerosol transfer diseases in the wintertime. Our cold and flu season here is 
actually a little bit different. Um, I mean, Las Vegas is a weird thing because we have people coming from so many different places uh, to come here, at least when there's not a pandemic going on. Uh, but if you take, say, Phoenix, Arizona, um, their cold and flu season lasts, you know, a little bit longer. And it's pretty common for them to have cold and flu during summertime when everyone's staying more indoors. There are other reasons why cold and flu are not so common in the, uh, uh, in the summertime, or particularly flu, but like summertime colds are not at all uncommon in those sorts of desert climates. Last, we have vector transmission. This is where you have a thing that moves. And that thing that moves is going to be what transfers the disease. Vectors come in two parts, biological and mechanical. And you might think that biological means living things and like mechanical means, you know, I don't know, like machines, but you would be wrong because biological like vectors and mechanical vectors are mostly both going to be living things. Uh, the difference is where the disease is, right? So with biological vectors, the thing that is transferring the disease has the pathogen inside of it and usually serves as a host for the pathogen. The pathogen often completes an important part of its life cycle inside the biological vector. Um, these are mostly going to be insects, uh, things like mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, etc. Um, and like a good example of this is malaria. The malarial parasite can only be transferred from person to person by a uh, mosquito vector. And it can't be just any mosquito. It has to be the Anopheles mosquito. And like, um, it would actually be quite difficult. It, e even if I was to take, uh, like, even if I was to get a blood transfusion from you, it would be very difficult to transfer malaria. Not impossible, but very difficult. And that's because like the malarial parasite actually has to be inside the, um, the mosquito to complete an important part of its life and to become infectious. It's carried inside the mosquito. The mosquito has to bite you in order to uh, transfer the disease. Now, a mechanical vector usually just means the insect or the whatever just like gets some stuff on it and then moves it someplace else, maybe tracks it around or something like that. So for instance, uh, say you've got, uh, like a fly and the fly lands on a big pile of dog poop, right? As flies are wont to do, walks around, you know, gets a bunch of bacteria on its like fly legs, then buzzes off and then lands on your pizza, walks around on your pizza and tracks all that bacteria onto your pizza. That would be a mechanical vector because that bacteria was never inside the fly. It didn't live inside the fly. The fly was not a host to it. It was just on the fly. And the fly tracked it around like you track mud places. Uh, so that's a mechanical vector. Even though flies are alive, and flies are definitely biological, that is still considered a mechanical vector. Those, in general, are the ways that diseases get around.